the way that we measure time, the way that we record the passage of time, is intimately connected with astronomy. If our Earth rotated differently and was tilted differently and orbited a different distance from the sun, all of those things would affect how we measure time. And so today we're going to think about that connection between astronomy and measures of time. So let's first take stock of the different measures that we use in our everyday lives. Seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, years. A year is the time it takes the Earth to go around the Sun once. A month, the time for the Moon to orbit the Earth once, essentially. We'll, we'll get into more detail in all of these and, um, and kind of hit on the subtleties. But broadly speaking, a year is the time for the Earth to go around the Sun once, and a month is the time for the Moon to orbit the Earth once. A day is the time for the Earth to spin on its axis once. And then from there, we subdivide days into smaller and smaller increments based on uh, numbers that early astronomers found to be very important or useful. The first is that we take a day and divide it into 24 hours. That's two 12-hour blocks. 12 for day, 12 for night, essentially. And that number 12 comes from our studies of the constellations and the moon. There are about 12 lunar cycles, 12 months in a year. Uh, and there are 12 uh, zodiac signs. Or I, as we've talked about, there are actually 13, but there are 12 recognized official zodiac signs. And so that number 12 was important, and early astronomers needed a way to subdivide the day and breaking it into two 24-hour blocks uh, has turned out to be very useful. Just think about how much of your day is planned out based on hours, hourly appointments, um, practices. Uh, we, we have found dividing the day into hours to be very useful. But keep in mind that that's not directly given to us by astronomy like it is for a year, a month, and a day. Hours are more of a human choice. We decided that this was useful. And we also decided it was useful to have units of time smaller than an hour. So we have 60 minutes in an hour and 60 seconds in a minute. And the number 60 is important for a different reason. Uh, and it's more of a strictly math reason that it's the only number evenly divisible by the integers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So think about that. 60 over 1 is 60. 60 over 2 is 30. 60 over 3 is 20. 60 over 4 is 15, 60 over 5 is 12, so there we get that 12 again, and 60 over 6 is 10. So you might ask, well, why does that matter? Maybe it's kind of an odd fact, but why does it matter? Well, they didn't have calculators, they didn't have devices they could easily do math with. That made uh, the math pretty easy because you can divide this number by all the integers 1 through 6 and get an even number. Um, and so mathematically it was a nice number to work with. And it stuck. Alright, so I mentioned that the fact that at the beginning that the fact that the Earth rotates and uh, has it tilted on its axis and its distance from the Sun, these things all affect the way we measure of time. So let's first think about the rotation. Uh, if the Earth did not rotate at all, that would change a lot. We would have one day a year, right? If it's not rotating on its axis, it's just stationary. Well, stationary in terms of its rotation, but it's still moving around the sun. Then let's say you were facing, so you looked overhead and, and the constellation, the Big Dipper, is directly overhead. Well, if the Earth's not rotating, the constellation, the Big Dipper, is always going to be there in that same position. And so the Sun is only going to make its way around the Earth as the Earth makes its way around the Sun. So a day would become a year. But other things would change as well. We would have no sense of north and south. There would be no way to define that. Uh, it may be hard to think about the Earth that way because it's so ingrained in us, but there would be no North Pole 
or south pole if the Earth wasn't spinning on its axis, right? There'd be no sense of, of north and south. There'd be no way to, to decide that, no physical way anyway. But the Earth does rotate, and so that gives us a way to map out the Earth, right? It gives us a sense of north and south. And so we have lines on the Earth, or we imagine lines on the Earth running north and south, uh, the first of those lines is the prime meridian. So that's this line over here, the prime meridian. Kind of goes through Europe and Africa. Uh, and that's where we start measuring longitude. So all of these lines north and south are longitude. And so we can talk about going west on the globe or east on the globe. Uh, and, and so there are lines... Uh, west of the prime meridian in longitude and east of the prime meridian in longitude. Uh, and we count up from 0 to 180, both directions. So we could go, uh, let's see, um, to about where we are, right? And let's see if we can figure out. So it's 180 degrees to here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 chunks. So I think these are 30 degree increments. So 30, 60, we're at about like 70 degrees west longitude of the prime meridian. Uh, and then we can also measure lines of latitude starting from the equator, right? So the equator is the, going right through the, uh, the, the middle of the globe, and we can measure lines of latitude going north and south. So the lines of longitude run east and west, and then we measure them as uh, sorry, the lines of longitude run north and south, and we measure them as so much uh, west, la uh, so many degrees west latitude longitude, and so many degrees east longitude, and the lines of latitude run east and west, and we talk about them as so many degrees north latitude and so many degrees south latitude. All right, so the fact that the Earth rotates gives us this sense of north and south and east and west and allows us to put a grid that we can use to talk about what time of day it is or time of year. Okay, but not only rotating, it's rotating on a tilt. It's tilted at 23 and a half degrees. And we've already talked about this before, but that 23 and a half degree tilt is responsible for the seasons that we experience on Earth. If we had no tilt to the Earth's axis, we would have days, just like normal. We could have 24-hour days, uh, but we wouldn't have seasons. But the fact that it's tilted and that tilt is always pointing in the same way as the Earth goes around the sun means that the angle of sunlight changes where you are on the globe, your latitude and longitude, over the course of a year. And so in thinking about that, it's, it's helpful to have these four specific dates in mind. The two solstices, the summer solstice and the winter solstice, and the two equinoxes, the vernal and autumnal equinox. Now, I prefer to say these in more common terms. So the vernal equinox, I usually call the spring equinox, and the autumnal equinox, the fall equinox. Uh, but this marks the start of spring, start of summer, start of fall start of winter. Now to see why the tilt affects the seasons, this illustration here is really helpful. So imagine the sun is coming in at two different angles. One, it's pretty high in the sky, right? So this would be, uh, you know, like your summer sunlight, and this could be your winter sunlight. So you're tilted towards the sun here, so the sun is higher in the sky all that sunlight is spread over a small area. Okay, so it's say, say taking um, one square meter of the, of the sunlight at an angle of 73 degrees, so an elevation of, of 73 degrees. Uh, well, that, that sunlight would get spread over 1.04 square meters. Well, if you take that same amount of sunlight, one square meter, and the sun is coming at 26 degrees, instead of 73, then that same sunlight gets spread over 2.24 square meters. So same amount of sunlight, 
spread over a bigger area means it's less intense. So colder, warmer. And uh, you'll get a little bit more experience of this when you do the uh, sun observation lab and you'll actually measure the elevation of the sun in the sky over the course of one day. All right, so the elevation of the sun is affected by your latitude and what time of year it is. <clears throat> so we should be uh, familiar with five special degrees, uh, sorry, not degrees, five special lines of latitude. We've already talked about the equator, the midline, uh, that's zero degrees latitude, but then there are four other important lines. The two tropics, the Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn, and the two Arctics, the Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, and you may not be familiar with this, but they are cre cre uh, created to, uh, to represent where the sunlight, uh, what the sunlight is doing uh, on the globe. So they're there for a purpose. Let's start with the Arctics. In the Arctics, it can be perpetual day or perpetual night, depending on the time of the year. Those lines extend from, from 90 degrees, so they extend from here, to 90 minus 23.5, right? So if you imagine a line going from here down to here, so intersecting the Arctic Circle here at its edge and the Antarctic Circle down here at this edge, that would be just straight up and down, right? So the angle between here and here, that's 23 and a half degrees. So when the Earth is tilted towards the sun by 23 and a half degrees, so summer solstice, then the sunlight is always going to be on this Arctic Circle. Now imagine the Earth spinning around. Everywhere inside this Arctic Circle will be in daylight, and everywhere inside the Antarctic Circle will be in night. Okay, so that's what those lines define. Uh, there are places within, or all the places within the Arctic Circle and the Antarctic, Antarctic Circle have times of year where there's perpetual day and perpetual night. So the sun never rises for a certain period of time and then it never sets for a certain period of time. The tropics are also related to this 23 and a half degrees. They're 23 and a half degrees from the equator. And what they refer to is locations where the sun can be at some point in the year directly overhead. So if you live within the tropics, at some point in the year, you'll have the experience where the sun is at your zenith. So think about that right now. The, the Tropic of Cancer, the line, everywhere along the line for the Tropic of Cancer on the summer solstice will have sunlight directly overhead. This might make you remember the uh, Eratosthenes example because he was using this fact that uh, we didn't talk about tropics at that time, but that on the summer solstice the sunlight was directly overhead. Well, the location he was referring to was on the Tropic of Cancer. Okay. Now on the winter solstice, the sun would be on the other side and the Tropic of Capricorn would be where the sun is at the zenith uh, at its highest point in the sky. But only where you, where you are within the tropics will that be true. It can never be true in New Hampshire that the sun is at your zenith. <clears throat> it just can't happen uh, outside of that 23 and a half degrees from the equator. All right, now we'll go through this one quickly. Um, this is just showing you the summer solstice. So it's the same picture we were looking at a second ago and then the winter solstice. Okay, um, so during the, the winter solstice, everything flips. The northern uh, summer becomes the southern summer. The Antarctic Circle is perpetual day and the Arctic Circle is perpetual night. The Tropic of Capricorn now has the sun in its zenith uh, at the winter solstice. 
I should mention that what we call the summer solstice, it's not, it's not that, uh, it's not that their definition of summer is different in the southern hemisphere. It's they actually change the names of these two things. So this is the summer solstice for the northern hemisphere. This is the winter solstice for the northern hemisphere. Um, this is the so winter solstice for the southern and the summer solstice for the winter for for the for the south for the southern hemisphere. Okay, now let's think about a day. A day specifically. What defines a day? There's actually two definitions. One is a sidereal day. <clears throat> and this might be what you come to first as a definition. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's what happens when the Earth rotates 360 degrees. And so that's probably what you thought of as a day. One day is one rotation of the Earth on its axis. One 360 degree rotation. But it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, what we usually think of as a day is a solar day, not a sidereal day. And that's because our definition of a day is connected to where the sun is. And because the Earth is rotating and moving in its orbit, those are not the same thing. Now, if the Earth was stationary in its orbit, it wasn't moving, then one 360-degree ro rotation would be the same as one trip of the sun. But they're not the same because the Earth is moving, and so to orient the sun to the s back to the same spot in the sky, the Earth needs to actually rotate a little bit more. Now, I think one of the homework problems asked you, how far in the Earth's orbit does it move each day? And m most of you seem to put together that there's 365 days in a year and 360 degrees in a circle, and so it moves about a degree per day. Well, that means to get the sun back to the same point in the sky, the Earth doesn't need to ro rotate 360 degrees. It actually needs to rotate 361 degrees. So the picture, I, I think, will be helpful here. Imagine this, this red thing is a person standing on the Earth, and the sun is directly overhead. Now, a day later, the sun should be directly overhead again. But if you just go to a 360-degree rotation, the Earth will have moved up here, and directly overhead would be that way. Okay. You need to rotate a little bit more, that one extra degree, so that the sun is directly overhead again. So we call that a sidereal day for one 360-degree rotation and a solar day for um, returning the sun to the same spot in the sky. Uh, and that extra one degree rotation corresponds to about four minutes of time. So a sidereal day is actually 23 hours and 56 minutes. That's the amount of time it takes the Earth to rotate once. But a solar day is defined to be exactly 24 hours. So, okay, we have a deep question on this slide. When does time begin? Well, you're referring to time on the Earth, our clocks that we use on Earth. Where do we start our clocks? The Earth is a circle. There's no definite starting point. Uh, I mentioned in, the, I think in one of the first slides that the prime meridian is the starting point for our measurement of longitude, right? That's zero degrees longitude. Uh, and then, then the equator is zero degrees latitude. Now, for zero degrees latitude, it's pretty clear where that has to be. When the Earth is rotating the way it is, there's going to be a midline that is exactly perpendicular to the axis of rotation. So there's no other place to put the equator except at that one midline. But that's not so true for lines of longitude. Where do we put zero degrees longitude? Well, the answer is we just have to pick somewhere. It doesn't matter where. There's no special uh, longitude on the Earth. All of the longitudes are rotating around in the same way. Uh, so there's no special longitude. But we do have to pick something, and the prime meridian was the choice 
for zero degrees longitude. And so the, pr the prime meridian is somewhere around here, right? And so that is zero degrees longitude. But that's not where we start our clocks. We start our clocks about 180 degrees from that. So if you go to 180 degrees in either direction, you end up here. And instead of making this a perfectly straight line, uh, we start our clocks on this jagged line called the International Date Line. So we have to think about why that would be. Why don't we just make it a straight line? Why don't we just make it the prime meridian? Well, there's a very practical reason. Where you start your clocks is going to affect the clocks through all the countries where that intersects. So if you have the international date line intersecting a country, then on one side of the, the date line, it'll be one time in, or one day, and on the other side, it'll be another day. The international date line decides where one day transitions to another. And so it was decided, and I think smartly, that we don't want to have the situation where it's two different days in the same country. So it would be preferable to have the international date line occur over water, right? Where it's only over water and it's not intersecting any, any countries. Uh, <clears throat> And so if you look at the, the land mass of the Earth, there's only a couple of places you could put it. You could have put it over here, right? You could have put it along here. Um, but I imagine there are other countries that are dispersed in the, in the, in the uh, Atlantic Ocean here that would have uh, made that more, more complicated that aren't really shown on this. Uh, but any, whatever the case may be, the decision was made to put the international date line here and to avoid the situation where two countries have different uh, days, it, it juts out around those countries. So we have it jut out here around the Aleutian Islands so that the Aleutian Islands, which are a part of Alaska, are all on the same day. And that's the international date line. That's where we start our time. Uh, the day transitions here. So this is... We say the sun rises in the east, the new year begins over here in the east, and we think of this as the east, and this and the country is sort of from here and here as the west. Um, that's sort of in reference to where the, where the international date line is. Otherwise, uh, lines of longitude are, are not biased in any way, and that's all human creation and for our own convenience. Okay, so that's it for, for now for on measures of time. We've covered the, the different units of time and, and, uh, and where they come from. Some of the things are directly from astronomy. Some things are indirectly from astronomy and more human choices, but also infused with, with some astronomical knowledge. In the next video, we'll take a look at the moon specifically and get into detail on what happens in the moon or with the moon over the course of a month and certain other phenomenon involving the moon.